Thank you, Carolyn. Brian, I hope this doesn't completely throw you if I do the video at the end of things today. Okay. While I'm chasing that rabbit, I just was talking to someone the other day who hadn't been here for three years, and when they came back and saw Crestview uh, at today as compared to what it was three years ago, I mean, she was just knocked off her socks, you know, said, wow, just what's going on here? Uh, and I told her, you know, the, the one person I think the Lord perhaps has used to make the, the biggest change around here is Brian Crow. You don't see it unless he messes up, <laughs> which is very seldom. But uh, he is a man of many, many gifts, and God has blessed us with him. And, and the man, I thank you. I do. I do. I hate meetings. Back in the corporate world when I was important, uh, I, I was able to set my meetings when I wanted to, and so uh, I used to call all the meetings to happen in my office, and I didn't have any chairs in my office. And so meetings would last however long you could stand standing up, but uh, I, I just didn't like meetings. And so th all that introduction to say this is going to sound strange, but one of my favorite times every week is our staff meeting. It's really kind of odd that, that I look forward to that so much every week because uh, we gather together in Dan's office. He begins with a, a scripture reading and a small, uh, um, just a little short little Bible study sometimes. But uh, you never know what's going to happen in our staff meeting. Sometimes revival breaks out. I am not kidding you. Sometimes there's just a revival breaks out there. Brian, amen, right, brother? And uh, I, I just... I don't know, I just look forward to it so much. And then last week, he did something he's never done before. Dan started the meeting with a little scripture and, and said, you know what, I would, like, I would like you to tell me why you think God called you to Crestview. Whoa. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, for example, but, uh, you know, it, it was kind of interesting to hear. We'd, we'd go around the table, and each one of the, the staff members would, would say, what they thought God brought them here to do. And as it progressed, I looked around the room and I thought, this is a weird group of people. <laughs> really? I, and, and I looked around and I said, this is like a circus. I mean, this is crazy, the, the different people that we have here. Well, just a few weeks ago, I was in Nashville attending a seminar there, and one of the things they did was give us this, one of the Myers-Briggs types things, where, where they talked about your personality types. Uh, and, and I've taken a million of them, but they can be life-changing in one way. It, it helps to know uh, what the other people around you value, and so you can be a more effective communicator. And, at, you know, we all took our little tests, and, and uh, there weren't any real surprises. But at a break, I was talking to a pastor from an uh, associate pastor from another church. Uh, and he said, to, well, uh, how did your staff do? And I said, well, you know, we only had a, a couple of us here, but I know exactly how our staff would, would fall out. Uh, and, and he said, well, our pastor's here, and all of ours look kind of alike. I said, well, that's interesting, because ours are completely different all, all over the board. And as I used to study organizational dynamics back when I was in the corporate world, one of the phenomena that, that happens is that leaders tend to surround themselves with people like them. Uh, they're easier to communicate with, uh, and, and so uh, it, it's just easier to work with. But it's the least effective way to get anything done, because you really need to surround yourself with people who aren't like you. Now, that makes you crazy sometimes because they're not like you, and you wonder why we're not speaking the same language, but in the end, you get much more accomplished like that. And I thought, I know Dan doesn't have any, any training in this, but I think he's a natural at surrounding himself with people with varied gifts, completely varied gifts. And he manages to keep us all smoothed over when we drive each other crazy. Now, if you're wondering where I'm going with all this, turn to chapter 12 of Romans, and let's talk about it just a little bit. One thing that I like to do at least every year or so is, is kind of review with you what you should expect from me because it's what I expect from myself and what I think that the Lord expects from me. And that's that I want to make the Bible come alive. I pray every week that it flowers, that it comes alive in, in your life because it's a living document that, that's the means through which God reveals himself. And so I feel my job is to look at every scripture, examine it closely, and say, okay, what does it say? 
might seem very basic, but let's talk about what it says, uh, because we don't have the autographs, we don't have the originals. Let's talk about what it says, and then let's talk about what it means, because sometimes that's not terribly clear to us. But last, I think I, I'm just not doing my job if, if we don't also answer, well, what does it mean to me? Because this is not history, it's not some esoteric uh, the, theology lesson. Uh, every bit of Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable. So when you read it, let's find out, okay, what does it mean to me? I didn't think that up myself. I got it from Paul. And in the lesson today, what we're going to find is that we've, we've worked through some weighty, need I say heavy, uh, difficult at times theology. Uh, this is not like reading in Romans. But we do get to the point in chapter 12 where, where Paul says, okay, how do we respond? What does it mean to me? This is what Paul's doing now. So in chapter 12, he says, therefore... Don't you hate it when he starts with the therefore? That means you've got to look back and look at the lessons that we've talked about, about grace, about, uh, about the law, about our relationship, about the fact that we are sinners, Romans 3.23. You know, so we have, tra we have traversed a good part of the Roman road by this point. And he says, okay, we've talked about that, therefore. In other words, what's next? I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. I want to stop there just a minute because that meant a great deal to the audience to whom he wrote it. doesn't mean so much to us because we don't understand the concept of sacrifice in the biblical sense. Uh, there is a Levitical principle found in the book of Leviticus, a principle that says that, that sin, okay, forgiveness of sin calls for the shedding of blood. Ooh, yuck. You know, we don't know what to do with that sometimes, but that's very biblical. And, and so much about what's going on in Scripture revolves around that, that I want you to understand that. Uh, and so we had the sacrificial system prescribed in Leviticus about, you know, we had to slay a lamb or a goat or a bull or a, or a bird or something like that. Because the, the shedding of blood used to, was, still is, required for our sins to be forgiven. Okay, God had another plan, however, and he says, you know, we can, we can slay all the lambs until the blood runs knee deep in the temple. Uh, but you know what we've got to do is, is sin is so pervasive in our lives, I'm going to give the ultimate sacrifice and we're going to shed the blood of my son. So when he's talking about sacrifices, he's going to say to us, okay, what does that mean to us? Well, that means we need to offer a sacrifice to God. Okay, what is that? Ourselves. As living sacrifices. Now, it, it, it almost sounds like an oxymoron because sacrifice was a, uh, sometimes you, you had to kill it. But this time he said, no, I want you to be a living sacrifice. So I want you to stop and think about your role in that. That's, that implies something on your part, right? Offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And he talks about offer our bodies because he says, I'm going to take this out of the realm of the spiritual. And I'm going to say, okay, I want you to offer yourselves. Everything about you. He's going to talk about that just a little bit more. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He's separating that from a physical act of worship, i.e. going to church. And there are some people, well, there have always been people, not just today. There have always been people who look at worship as something physical I do. I go light a candle. Uh, I go do something, you know, I go, uh, you know. Uh, when I was uh, young in the Methodist church, it was very, a, a very liturgical style of worship. Uh, I could pretty well say, tell every week we would sing the Gloria Patri. We would say the, uh, the, the, the Apostles' Creed all together. Uh, and, and I could say that when I was three or four years old. I had no idea in the world what I was saying, but I could, I could say all the words. He says those are physical acts of worship. Now he's talking about a spiritual act of worship, and it involves us doing something. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Did you catch that in the sermon this morning? Okay, I, I was looking around to say, okay, how many people in my class have actually read chapter, chapter 12? But the word conform means to mold, to, to push. The, the example that's used quite frequently in Scripture is clay. The potter uses a clay. He conforms it. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me not get too far away from that because I know it's not a new phenomenon. It's happened before in the history of the church. But I think today, 
as never before in my lifetime at least, we have been conformed to the world. There is no real difference other than the fact that we're here in this building on Sunday morning uh, between us and the world. Because I've got to tell you, the rest of the week, for the most part, we live just like they do. And I, I use the generic we. I'm not particularly talking about you uh, but, or, or myself because I, I would hope there are some differences. But I've got to tell you, the church is not a whole lot different from the world, and that's what Paul warned against. He said, don't let them mold you into your way of thinking. If you haven't heard the pastor's message today, pay careful attention because that's what he's talking about. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that would indicate there's some change, renewing. Some change is going on in your mind that's going to transform. What does it transform? You take the modifier, that's a modifier for what just went on before, conforming to the world. He says, no, what you should do is when, when the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, then that should move you away from the world. You should open up that gap between you and the rest of the world. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, when you are moving away from the old self, and I love Pauline literature is full of the idea of a new creation. Um, I didn't have to struggle with that at all because I was saved when I was 30 years old. Karen and I have talked about this before. Uh, how were you, dear, when you were baptized? Five, six? Seven, seven years old. Uh, it's kind of difficult to say um, you had a, a, a powerful, dramatic testimony when you, were, when you were saved and baptized when you were seven. Now, you were probably wicked, though, by the, when you were seven, though, right? <laughs> I know what your parents said, you know. <laughs> but, but stop. Well, we talked about that. She says, well, you know, I don't recall a big change in the way I live because she was raised in church. Let me tell you what, wonderful, wonderful parents. But we all, whether we're saved at 7 or saved at 37, uh, we all are new creatures. The change may be slight but definite, uh, or it may be dramatic. But we are new creatures, and the renewing of our minds moves us further and further away from being conformed to the world. That is God's will. Is that perfect? Well, duh, it's God's. For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. I want to just stop and let that marinate for just a minute because that is so un-American. That is so un 21st century because everything that we're faced with in our society today says you're pretty special you need the things you deserve if you just get that credit card or or wayne wright will get you what you deserve <laughs> because you're special and I've shared with you before that one of the things I really loved doing was volunteering as a mentor at the local high school back where we used to work. And, and when I came, I said, well, what do I do? And they said, well, you do whatever you want to for 30 minutes, but we've got some suggestions, and here's a weekly lesson plan. Every single one of them was about raising the children's self-esteem. I'm here to tell you, those children didn't have any problem with self-esteem. Every single one of them thought the entire universe revolved right around their little pointed heads. Every single one of them. There might be people with low self-esteem. Okay. But what we've done is we've told them, you're special. You're special. You're special. And look what Paul's saying. <laughs> you're not so special. Don't think of yourself as more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now, let me, you'll see in a minute where he's going, but let me kind of give you an idea of why he's, he's walking down this trail right now. You know from the letters at the church at Corinth that there had arisen difficulties with people saying, well, I'm more spiritual. You know, my spiritual gift is the greater spiritual gift. And people were, there, there arose a class of super Christians. We haven't gotten that out of the church to this day. Because we can all at some point or another, another tend to think, you know, boy, God, you're really lucky you've got me. I'm on your team. You did good. You picked well. And there was a lot of that going on. And he says, look, don't think of yourself as being all that special. Look at yourself with sober judgment. And that's why I'm, I'm getting back to what, what I talked about about our staff meeting this week. God put each and every one of those oddballs on that staff. 
for a reason. For a reason. And one of the things that I shared, and I don't mind sharing with you, I had struggled when I first came here because my whole life I've been the quarterback. Welcome to Crestview, you're an offensive guard. <laughs> and I've always said, I'm the guy behind the parade with the shovel. That's what I do here. That's my job. Nothing in my previous training prepared me for that, but God did. And now I found I feel much more in His good and perfect will as an offensive guard. Now look what he says. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, two very important things there. I want you to stop and look. We're placed here. Let's, let's start with that. But then he says, okay, we're placed here for different purposes, but we're all here for each other. There are no solo, there are no lone ranger Christians here. We're all placed in a body. Now, uh, there has arisen, uh, particularly in these days uh, among young people, it's nothing new because I thought it when I was young, uh, I don't need the church. The church is a corrupt institution. You know, there are just a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, you're right. You are. Come join us. We'll have one more. <laughs> but the fact is we're supposed to be here together. We are called to be here together. We are placed here together. Why? Because we're given gifts for the edification of the body. In other words, to help the church, to praise God, and to help one another, to carry one another's burdens. And as a Lone Ranger Christian, you can't do that. You can't help another person nearly like you can as being part of the body. And you can't be helped when you need it. And you sorely need that. So he says, look, we're placed all there together. And it's kind of interesting uh, when he's talking in 1 Corinthians. He's talking about, well, the foot can't say to the eye, well, you know, I, I don't need you. Well, you do. Now, some parts of the body are more honorable than others. What part is that? I don't know. I don't think I'm qualified to say. God may honor one above the other, but, but they're all honorable. And I do know this. What man thinks of as being very important generally doesn't register too well with God. And so many times, I'm really, I'm, I feel kind of... Um, I'm really humble sometimes when I stand up here, particularly when I'm called on to preach. And I think, well, everybody knows who Jack is because I start every service and my ugly face is always up here right on display. And, and, uh, and people see me a lot. I'm out front. But you know what? There are so many more people whom I think are so much more valuable to the life of this church than I am that don't ever get the airtime, that you don't see. Uh, and... and you know, like I said, okay, Brian kind of labors in the background, except for Sunday night. You really ought to come to Sunday night. The, the guy can play the guitar, too, and sing. Uh, but there are people who kind of labor in anonymity happily. Um, I think one of the times I was most fulfilled in working in a church is when I was working in the, in the nursery. I got to tell you, nobody knows who those people are. But, wow, what a ministry. What a ministry. And so... Paul's saying, look, you're all placed here. You've all got a job to do. You intertwine. You're dependent on one another. But don't think of yourself too highly because of your gift. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in a proportion to his faith. That's kind of interesting. Prophecy isn't seeing the future, isn't running the Ouija board. Prophecy is sharing God's truth. And if that's your gift, you should use it. Uh, should you use it past the, past the measure to which you've been gifted? Huh. You're to share the truth you have given. I am not Billy Graham-esque in my delivery. Uh, I stumble and bumble a lot. Uh, I'm not called to be a silver-tongued orator. I'm called to share truth. Paul was called to share truth. Do it according to your ability. If it's serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him, let him encourage. And if it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leading, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Have you started noticing all those little traits? Uh, and I'm not using the word because I want to say, you know, there's another list, several other places in Scripture. What do we call those? Spiritual gifts. 
Those are all spiritual gifts. And this list is different than some of the other lists that we, lists that we have. The idea being that no list is all inclusive, but there are many, many spiritual gifts that God gives you. Why? To use for the edification of the body. Dr. Phil has a statement that I like. He says, I'm going to put verbs in my sentences. I kind of like that because it's one thing to talk about vague concepts and what do you think about that? But he says, okay, at the end of the, at the, end of the lesson, what do we do? Love must be sincere. Why do you think he would have to say that? Too often our love is conditional. That's not genuine love. Must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Sometimes I've wanted to just quote that scripture in the middle of a church business meeting. Not here. Not here. Our church business meetings are spooky quiet. Sometimes I wonder about you people. <laughs> Is this a Baptist church? But one of the things that, that I think Jesus taught more than anything else is, is that it's, it's not about me, it's about thee. That really you ought to place the welfare, the good of your brothers and sisters above your own. And that's what he's talking about here. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Have you ever felt flat sometimes in your spiritual life? That's when you really need to, a, ref, a filling of the Holy Spirit. i got to tell you right now, we've got a Holy Spirit tailwind at Crestview. And sometimes I just shake my head saying, there's no way of explaining the things that go on sometimes around here apart from the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't always happen. I've been in churches where that wasn't quite so evident. The same thing in our spiritual lives. It, it's understanding that sometimes we wear down, but refresh yourself and fill yourself, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that brings the spiritual fervor that he's talking about in serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Anybody here had affliction? Did you really want to be patient during the infliction, affliction? Not me. But that's, that's so Pauline. Has anybody, has, do you think he's been through affliction? Listen, he can talk. I, I'm listening to this man because he's an expert in affliction. He has been afflicted. He wants us to be patient in that. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. I'm okay with this so far. And I get to the next part and I kind of, anybody remember Happy Days? Remember the Fonz? Remember the Fonz couldn't say I'm sorry? Okay. Well, here's the next one. I just kind of, I could say all these other things, but when it comes to bless those who persecute you, I kind of go, because <laughs> I have difficulty with that. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Um, I do a training course with, with our deacons. Uh, I've done it a couple of times since I've been here about hospital visits, how to visit hospitals. Uh, it's where I met Denny, as a matter of fact, where I met Dennis Leadham. Uh, visiting hospitals. I love to do that, something God's called me to do. It's amazing. If you get a group of deacons, you'll find five to ten of them in there who just can't do it. I, I can't go. They just creep me out. They just, they, you know, I can't go. And what I find out that one of the problems that people have is they don't know how to talk to people who are undergoing difficulties or who have experienced tragedy in their lives. Because, you know, when you're with someone who's just lost a loved one, what do I say? Here's a thought. Nothing. Don't have to say anything. And that's what it's talking about. They're being there for one another. Living in harmony. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. I eat lunch every Tuesday with several guys of low position, so I like to be able to spare, spend that. I tell them I need to hang around with a higher class of person, you know it. But uh, I always joke with them about that, and we, we, you know, we always get a good laugh about it. But, you know, uh, what the pastor was talking about today, too, 
about it's one thing to have truth, but, but it's also another thing to, that you have to have mercy. And that's going to require you hanging out with some people that perhaps you think might be below your station. That's so unchristian. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is impossible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What are we called to do? Be peacemakers. They're blessed. That's not easy sometimes. Uh, do we need to be uh, uh, conscientious objectors? Not necessarily, but we should not be warlike. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Let me tell you, I've struggled with that over time, and I've struggled with forgiving people who have wronged me. I haven't had to deal with that much in my life. I've, I've been very blessed. But I, when it has happened, I've struggled with it a little bit. And the more I'm in this, the more I'm in the ministry, and I'm working with people and counseling with people, the more I find how unresolved issues of hate eat away at you when you don't forgive the people who have wronged you. They still have a control on your life, and Satan is still working in your life as long as you carry that hate. And so don't forgive the person because you think it's going to do them good, necessarily. If nothing else, forgive them because, because it's the thing that you need to do. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's from Proverbs 25. And here's what that, that, that saying is that hopefully this person, seeing you forgive them, uh, will then realize that their need for, for Jesus, their need for salvation, their need for the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Turn back to uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse 2, if you will. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being transformed requires action on our part. Too often it seems today that seekers, that people who seek, seek spirituality, want cheap grace. Kind of bear with me here. Uh, and I'm borrowing a phrase from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading his, his biography by Eric Metaxas, and, and it's fascinating. He was a fascinating person, uh, and he lived what he believed. And I want to give you a quote from, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. And that struck me when I read that. I thought how true that is. Uh, is, is that I so, so often encounter people who want grace. They really do want grace. We want forgiveness, but we don't want to forgive. We want, a, we want a cheap grace that, requires, uh, uh, that doesn't require repentance. In other words, Lord, I want you to forgive me, but I don't want to repent. I don't want to confess my sins to you. And yet, if you've read through Romans, you, you, you'll see what he says. That if you, believe, if you if confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. So it does require repentance and it does require confession. One of the things I love about this new generation of young pastors that the Lord is raising up these days, and I've got to tell you, Jordan Cobb is one of them, uh, is that they get it. They get that this is not an easy thing, that this is a struggle that we go through, and it requires some action on our part rather than just coming, warming the pew, and swapping oxygen for carbon dioxide, which is something we do too often. Um, a few weeks ago in my message, I just happened to slip and confess that I really have grown fond of Christian hip-hop music. Now, that didn't offend too many people until they learned what hip-hop was. You mean you like that rap stuff? I don't, no, it's, what I, it's not, not what I said, because I, I think there's a lot of bad in that gangsta stuff, but I love all kinds of music. I just love music. 
And I've come to appreciate that not only as an art form, but as an expression of worship. Um, and, and when I was looking at one of my favorite artists, I came across what I really think is one of the most powerful sermons I have ever heard in my life. And it's just a shade over four minutes long. It's the full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told. God. Yes? God. The maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance. Seen and unseen. What can and can be touched. Thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans. God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, the concept, so cold. It's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond. Creator and creation held an eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong. A species got deceived and started lusting for his job. An odd list of complaints. As if the system ain't working. And used that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it and how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding besides trying to prove God is like defending a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet, the problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer. An asthma, choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection, but silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up your good deeds. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe, but all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection, good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank, but you could give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list, cause even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says as part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying, it's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back, you owe him. Eternally separated, and the only way to fix it is someone die in your place, and that someone gotta be perfect, or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness. His death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection we all cheered because that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood-stained son of man, fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone I mean everyone, who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. God, our sins.
I want to tell you, that's powerful. That's every bit as much the gospel as Billy Graham. And that young man can reach people I can't start to reach. And he's doing it. So I think we ought to pray that God lifts up more people with the gift of prophecy. They can share. Next week, chapter 13. Uh, you might or might not want to be here for this one. Because we're talking about submission. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for this young man who calls himself propaganda, Father, for his boldness in sharing the gospel in the face of a gangsta uh, community that he defies with the gospel. And I want to thank you for others like him, Father, who uh, are true to their call. Father, thank you for your word. After we read it, Father, we digest it. It, 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 your Holy Spirit brings it to us, Father. Now we act. And I want to thank you, Father, for a group who comes so faithfully to study it. Father, as we leave this place today, help us to remember that as we are always people sharing Jesus, and we do it in your name. Amen.